Okay. All right. We are into the third session. Welcome, everyone. And uh, again, the first session we have, we were looking at the learner and learning. And then the last session, uh, session two, we were looking at the uh, one who is delivering or developing the learning. Now we're looking at from the mixture of session one and session two in the context of how we uh, prepare content for employment purposes. Uh, technically, this is a very complex, uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, area. Uh, in 45 minutes, I'm doing just touch the surface and a potpourri of ideas. So if there's any interest to find out more, uh, please reach out to me and then we can take that separately. So I wanted to, again, contextualize to this particular um, screen, the diagram. Um, I put it together because uh, having listened to some speaker and read some articles, um, I realized that uh, a lot of times the effort was spent building uh, content for the time dependent type of competencies, which are important and uh, do deserve all the attention. Uh, my point being is that it will, they were, the amount of effort and attention given here was at the expense of the evergreen competencies. The evergreen competencies are what will help in a, a, a talent or employee survive change of jobs, management, industry issues, because that's exactly what it is, it's evergreen. You can cross industries, you can cross time zones, uh, the skills will go with you and serve you well. And, and this is just a very top level summary. Of course, uh, there, there can be much more, uh, but this was uh, in a way just meant to be uh, some initial download from the mind to get conversation going. So certainly I think everybody agrees, all HR, uh, startup employers, etc., are always looking at good communication. How good is the relational skills, ability to solve problems which require analyzing, uh, knowing where to access knowledge, knowing how to process that knowledge, uh, to actually uh, be able to determine if that source of information is accurate, or be able to have a discourse to debate with differing opinions, uh, not for the purpose of uh, posturing uh, opinions, but the purpose of um, uh, colliding ideas and to, to arrive at new ideas. Not, uh, not forgetting, of course, the whole uh, act of reflecting. And I think in today's uh, generation, particularly because of uh, social media and digital media, instancy of uh, if I click, I see, if I do this, I hear, if I do that, I, 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 I can appreciate. There is almost very little time to do reflection. It used to be when we sit on long bus rides, we look out the window and we'll reflect, or even in a long train ride. But today, most people will whip out their phone, they watch a movie, they listen to some songs, or whatever they do, they stop reflecting. So the making time and having the habit to reflect has taken a uh, back, back seat to a lot of habits. And as such, it is a loss because without reflection, the learning becomes very, very shallow instead of deep. And without deep learning, thinking is also going to be affected. Pattern recognition is also going to be affected. And with that, to be able to mentor and lead is Definitely not, not in the game also. So while we allow companies to spend effort in all this um, domain-specific type of content, let's not forget effort to build evergreen competency. So I wanted to, again, anchor into this slide before going ahead. So now this is a bit of a, uh, uh, what do you call, a sector-related type of uh, content but it, it provides very good context so i wanted to use this so bloom's taxonomy it's a uh, taxonomy or hierarchy of learning uh, and i believe he's passed away 
this guy has so much to the learning industry because practically every learning industry knows about this and used this as well. So it's a very uh, common reference point. So I'm now linking the Bloom's taxonomy hierarchy to what we have seen in an earlier diagram I shown uh, the last session. So at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy is what we call knowledge and comprehension, very much what I will consider as information. And in the information, remember we saw this diagram previously, uh, information is very much towards the short-term memory side of the uh, spectrum. And technically speaking, since it's very information and comprehension level, it, most of the learning should be centered around self-directed. There really isn't a big value add to have a human being uh, present to deliver the content. Uh, it's best package it, leave it to the person to, uh, the learner to self-consume, self-direct. So if this is the case, uh, we talked earlier about a uh, mobile app type of a, a platform. They land very well for information or knowledge comprehension type of content. Primarily, they focus on clarification. Uh, you know, the nature of content is very good for clarification, very good for definition, planning, logistics. Uh, communication would be things like, remember, tomorrow we will have this. Next week, we will have that. Entertainment, we know, transaction-based banking. So that's why in the mobile devices, we need to remember this nature of content does very well there, but not all other content, which we will see shortly. So if we are going to be building information for the mobile uh, devices, then the kind of intervention or draw reference from information design, uh, user interface, UI design mobile features which to uh, you know uh, certain things you can do on the laptop you cannot do on a mobile so there are a lot of things that is mapped for mobile and not for laptop that's why normally uh, you have questions asked is is do you have a mobile version we have mobile friendly which means it's developed for the web but it is accessible on mobile but if it's mobile first that means it's designed for the purpose of a uh, mobile device type of finger swiping up, down, or the, uh, the kind of uh, user interface, as opposed to the mouse clicking and shifting things. So, and because it's mobile data, uh, it's also very good for data mapping and for social interaction. So, therefore, I'm linking this nature of content at the lower end of the Bloom taxonomy to mobile design, or rather learning design for mobile devices. Now, if we move away and up towards the middle range of the taxonomy, now we move from purely information to actually learning. Now we focus on employability skills. So we talk about the ever, evergreen skills and the time dependent skills. We talk about work processes. So that means some of this learning will be enterprise centric. So how work processes might be in Microsoft will be different from Google or different from uh, uh, Netflix, for example. So that will be very uh, organizational uh, specific type of content. You have technology, you have work team collaborations, for example. And for this type of learning, the intervention will need learning design. It is a different school of thought. Information design and learning design is very different. Uh, unfortunately, in the market, a lot of people are using information design, which lends itself to things like uh, information graphics, that kind of thing. And they call that learning design, or they call information as learning. I differentiate that a lot because uh, as I presented previously, and in a few more slides, you will see that there's a strong need to differentiate between what's pure information and what's learning and what's performance. Okay? So in learning, we're also looking at behavioral modification. We want a current set of behavior to change or modify to a different set of behavior. There's going to be some element of social and experiential because it's not purely passive consumption of content. There is a need to digest, reflect, apply, 
and then have a dialogue over it. So progressive feedback. And there's also the need for simulation, especially as you move up to the level of synthesis or synthesizing. Then the next highest level or the highest level is performance. Uh, if you recall sometime last week, I was saying training doesn't equal learning. Learning doesn't equal performance. As far as corporate learning is concerned, I've often said, why are employers paying us to go get training? It's not because they're so benevolent. At the end of the day, when they invest in our development, it is supposed to bring back impact to the organization. Because if it does not improve the organization and bring in additional revenue or scale the business, then the employer is going to eventually bleed out. So let's be very clear, whatever the enterprise pay for uh, training, it must impact performance, which means we're looking at best practice in workplaces, business growth, talent leadership pipeline, and innovation for posterity purposes. And in this kind of intervention, if you noticed, it's more high touch, coaching, mentoring, performance engineering, and we're moving towards permanent change in behavior. Uh, I think COVID throws a very good uh, case study for us that permanent change in behavior is literally in the way we uh, have to put on mask, remember to wash our hand, remember to sit further away from one another, uh, the distancing when we stand in line. Uh, we're now pretty much on a second nature when we uh, go out. So that's a permanent change in behavior. When we say permanent, the question will be asked, if COVID is no longer around, will that behavior disappear? I suppose in a certain group of people, they become careless. But I think by, primarily, by and large, most um, city folks will still remember to stay a distance remember to be a bit more careful with their hands, careful with their environment. So that has become a permanent change in behavior. And there are other examples, of course. And definitely, it has to be workflow driven. Now, if I look back into this focus, the three have different designs. Well, mobility is the focus in knowledge and comprehension level. So whatever the design focus is, is about mobility, access. Now, when it comes down to learning design, the focus here is about um, sometimes classroom, sometimes what we call blended, how to bring that um, social learning in person uh, because now you really need a um, facilitator in, in the group. Now, of course, a lot of facilitation due to COVID is done online, but it compromises a lot of the values that if the facilitation is done in the classroom. Um, but if you notice in performance level, at performance level, it's no longer about going into a classroom, learning something separate from what I need to do on the job. But rather, performance-based uh, learning is I learn while on the job. Uh, somebody was saying that, um, say, if I'm an uh, uh, electronic or electrical engineer uh, dealing with uh, light and power, uh, powers uh, in different geographical locations, and I ran into some kind of a problem, the likelihood of me reaching out to another engineer who has done this nature of work in another geographical region is far higher than me reaching out to the trainer sitting in corporate, much less going and attend a class. So this ability to reach out to peers who have first-hand knowledge, it's the kind of learning uh, or intervention in performance-related uh, type of learning. Certainly not classroom, not, uh, the mobile will only come in for the purpose of phone call, maybe snapshot of photograph or have a video call, but real learning is person to person. Uh, any question at this moment before I move on? Assuming no question. Um, sorry, I was on mute. Uh -huh. uh, you know, this, uh, the highest level, uh, create, mm. charge, mm. and synthesize. Mm. Um, is it um, nature or, you know, nurture? I mean, I mean, do we expect everyone to reach this level? No, you're right. 
I also don't want to get into the can be somewhat uh, inconclusive nature versus nurture uh, because if I say it's nature, I preclude possibilities of otherwise. But I could uh, say that a lot of the folks who sit up in, who do a lot of that uh, type of decision making at the top of the pyramid, they would have definitely been nurtured they may have predisposition. So I come back to the, uh, one of the things I said last week about India and Thailand uh, and probably a few other nations in Asia. Their culture primarily is that of survival. And I think Hong Kong probably belong there as well. And so because of the challenge of the environment, uh, particularly in India or South Asia, chaos reigns, right? But in the chaos, there is order, some people say. So if you look at how a three-wheeler, uh, what we call auto driver in, in uh, India, uh, rides, they sometimes, in order to bypass the jam, they go against the traffic in order to go to the other direction. So would you call that as um, violation of traffic or would you call that as creative solutioning? So... These folks didn't go through a heavy duty uh, PhD training, but just purely, I don't want to be stuck in traffic for three hours. I will find a way if I can do a kind of a U turn in go against the opposite direction, uh, and then do a U turn to go to the direction I want. Uh, I think it can classify under making a judgment call and being creative about it. So. Nurture certainly plays a huge role. Nature, I would say, um, the, the verdict is still open. I'll put it that way. Hmm? Thanks. Hmm. Okay, I'll move on. Okay, this is something I've uh, shown before, but I just wanted to use this as a baseline uh, to, to, to contextualize, to build some over it. So we, we say that... Uh, to have deep learning, we really need a lot of things to make the new learning attach to an uh, existing thought through a lot of processing, a lot of rehearsal, a lot of uh, challenge uh, holes to it. In a way, that's like a super glue, right? Road learning is, got, mm, is, is your starch glue that can come unglued anytime. So there's no connection. It is a very lightweight glue. But for it to be really become permanently glued to our existing schema, we need to look at how to build that super glue. So the next few slides build on this idea of the super glue. This is just saying the same thing. So if we look at shallow learning is tell me, I will forget. Show me, I will remember a little bit. Okay. And but more importantly, if you involve me, allow me more more than just simply passively uh, doing something, you allow me to try it out. I, I like to use uh, what, uh, uh, something I used to quote um, um, in my own context. When I was growing up, I have a hugely, highly protective mother. And uh, it's like, um, I use the localized uh, language here. Yeah? There's a long kang, don't walk there. There's a long kang, don't go there, you will fall down. Long Kang obviously referring to a big canal. Um, then that uh, was up to year 24, 25 when I was in Singapore. And I had a chance to go live in the US for eight years. It was there that I realized that I did not know what it is to fall into the canal. I had no idea what it means. I only know don't go down. So the opportunity to actually fall into the canal, scrape my knees metaphorically, have a scare of my life, then that became a permanent change in my paradigm to know, don't ever do it. Uh, the other classic example is teach a child, don't touch the flame. The best thing is let the little kid burn a little bit and then never touch it again. Now in the, in the digital world, there's a, uh, some, uh, a context I'm borrowing from the classroom as well. If you look at the blue color text, 
in the classroom, uh, this is a, a phrases that was taught when I was studying work back in the 80s. Uh, tell me what you're going to tell me. So you ignore the black text for the time being. Then tell me. After that, tell me what you have told me. This is supposed to be the um, mantra those of us who are doing classroom delivery must remember. So now as we do go digital, it's the equivalent of saying, tell me where I'm going at the beginning. Then while you're taking me through the content, allow me to know where I am now in reference to where I came from. Then when I'm done with the content, allow me to know where I came from since the beginning. So when we're designing digital learning, these are all very critical, especially in e-learning. Now, once now we move away from e-learning into more of this micro-learning, uh, prosuming, there is still a very important need for uh, the user to, or the learner to know this. The question becomes, in times past, the designer is responsible to inform the learner. In current days, we are saying shift the ownership to the learner. So the learner should be the one who's establishing or establish or continues to establish. Where did I come from? Where am I now? Where am I going? This must be the, uh, in the paradigm of the learner. In times past, the, um, the one who is the guardian of this information is somebody else. So this is something that we bear in mind when we move into uh, the, the digitali digitalized uh, platforms. Okay, we went through this uh, before. Again, I, I wanted to make this an activity. Perhaps, nonetheless, uh, Su Chen, you can humor all of us by sharing. Think of an actual aha moment when you actually change a thought or a behavior or a habit. Was it as a result of sitting in a class? Was it as a result of uh, doing some e-learning? Or was it as a result of something else? You want to share? Possibly. Um, well, a recent one is, uh, um, I mean, uh, my health, right? Or mm. my weight problem. Mm. Um, I always thought that uh, I'm fine, I'm healthy. Um, but uh, I did a blood test just last week and my doctor said that, you know, I'm way over in sugar um, and, and my blood pressure is borderline and all that, mm. right? Um, and so um, then, you know, what do I do, right? And since it's borderline, you don't take medication. Um, and so they asked me to go and see a nurse who will help me change my lifestyle, you know, mm. because it requires a lifestyle change. And when I sat down with her, she said, uh, well, less ice cream, you know, and all the stuff that I enjoy, mm. and maybe uh, uh, take too much during the lockdown, uh, which mm. contributed to the problem. Mm. But I really didn't want to change, right? I mean, um, kind of thing. Um, but, um, um, but it was my wife, you know, who, actually, when I asked her for an ice cream, uh, you know, that night, right? She said, "Hey, you know, you know, um, you, you, you know, I don't want a diabetic husband. I don't want to look after <laughs> someone with diabetes, and you know, and all that." So then, that gave me the aha moment, right? Um, mm -hmm. Not the nurse. I mean, not really even the results, right? Mm. Because I was very, really reluctant to change because I mm. enjoy food. Mm. Um, but my wife uh, and the impact right, on her um, made me uh, um, got, get that, 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 that my, you know, my actions uh, mm. can impact uh, you know, someone I love. <laughs> mm. So that was my aha moment. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So it seems that if you ask almost, uh, if you ask this question, almost everyone uh, without uh, exception would say that most of the change in behavior did not happen as a result of somebody, uh, uh, we sit in a class and someone say, this is good, that's bad. Or for that matter, uh, I was just reflecting today, 
there's so many inspirational uh, videos out there. Um, I would dare say that had you listened to three or five uh, inspirational videos by different people, no matter how inspirational they are, you feel perhaps motivated for an hour or two, even a day, uh, it's still not going to be the aha moment. It's got to be something that touches us an even deeper level, which is at this impact level, that, that aha moment, which needs to be rehearsed, meaning your wife will continue to condition you by her love for you. She will continue to set the uh, environment in such a way that it will, again, what we said the last week, right? Um, positive reinforcement. If you do the behavior that's good for your health, you get a positive reinforcement. But if you uh, do something like you have an ice cream unknowingly or unthinkingly, then you may have a negative reinforcement. So by that stimulus and response conditioning over a period of time, the behavior will change. That's what we are talking about when you talk about employability skills and, and so on. So now I move on again to a uh, uh, slide that has been seen from previous time. So you, as you noticed, I am bringing back uh, some of the slides that I've gone through in the previous sessions to contextualize and build upon it. So if I take back uh, the context of planting new information, okay, and we go through this whole uh, thing from last week, whether it's going to be, you know, according to the parable of the sower, whether it's going to be before you even root the seed that the birds will come and eat the seed, or will it fall on the rocky soil, or will it be uh, crowded out by thorns, or will it fall on rich soil. So, I want to kind of challenge us in the context of Christian uh, focus in discipleship. Now, Without naming the organization, we know that the uh, international uh, uh, group has decided to take on, uh, to, to, to uh, continue their program, uh, multi multiple week program uh, as a form of uh, reaching out and discipling. Uh, they decided to use Zoom. Uh, they were discussing with me at one time, and, but senior leadership, from headquarters decided to use Zoom. Now, my, the, the, the thought that crosses my mind at that moment is Zoom as a medium and WhatsApp as an exchange is largely transmissional or what I also call transactional. One directional transmission, watching the videos, break out, talk, talk a little bit in the... Uh, be it breakout room, follow up with um, uh, WhatsApp. There is no, uh, you know, once you, the same thing with Facebook, same thing with WhatsApp is once you, or Skype, once you type in your messages, let's assume it's 10 days, four to five people writing. You get to the most recent, how are you going to trace back to the first two, three inputs? it will be a very tedious task to try and search for that context of things. So it's not meant, these tools are not meant for managing um, memory, not meant for um, building on top of a previous uh, context, but it's really very one-dimensional and transactional, hence I use the word transmissional. Now, if it stops there, I don't see that as discipleship. So, if you look at the bottom scale, right? Awareness, fine. You are aware of um, the uh, Bible, what the Bible talks about. Yeah, you know, maybe you can articulate a little bit about it. I think it pretty much stops there with Zoom sessions. Now, if you want to go more towards associating, we really need to add in relational aspects. There must be a lot of follow-up on a one-to-one. -one. There must be stretching moments to really cause the person to think beyond the comfort zone. Opportunity to reflect. This is as per what we were showing in the other diagram. As it gets more over this side, it should get more social. And this side can be more um, self-directed learning. 
So without that battling, the, that one diagram we went through and Harvard, you know, there must be a moment to reflect, a moment to consider, a moment to reconsider, and that's a deep internal battling. All this must be part of the discipleship process. If it is not, then you will never get down to adoption, you will never get down to anchoring the faith, so to speak. So I, I would challenge a lot of people out there who's designing uh, content for discipleship. If this is all it is, at best you report so many people attended. We have broadcast the video this, to this many people. We have held this session so many geographical regions. But do not celebrate the fact that it never got here. This is where we need to bring people to if you really want transformational discipline. Okay, this is something fun. Um, have you seen this before, Suchin? No. Then have fun. I'm sure you can read this. Okay. Let's read it out loud. Uh, how our mind can do amazing things. Um, In what in the beginning was hard, but now on your mind reading automatically without thinking about proudly <laughs> only certain people can read. Please forward if you can read this. Yeah, the last line I should have taken it off. So the seven is actually T. This message, <coughs> um, I was able to read it this afternoon. This um, message um, is to prove, serves to prove how our minds can do amazing things, impressive things. In the beginning, it was hard, but now on this line, your mind is reading it automatically without even thinking about it. Be proud. Only certain people can do this. Okay. The last part, I should just delete it. But essentially, this and I'll just do a few more fun ones coming. There's a, there's a reason for doing this. You want to read this? Um, only 55 people out of 100 can. I cannot believe that I could actually understand what I was reading. The Phenomenal power of the human mind, according to a research at Cambridge University. It doesn't matter in what order the letters in the word are. The only important thing is that the first and the last letter be the right place. The right. The rest. Oh, oh yeah. The rest <laughs> can be total. Misses. Okay, total misses, and you can still read it without a problem. This is because human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Amazing, huh? Yeah, and I always thought spelling was important. So, one more last one, and then I get to my point. You, you mean read those? Uh, the blue, blue text, yeah. Jakan D. Ah, no, same way, try to figure out what the... Oh, 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 oh. Hmm. Once you can figure out one, you can figure out the rest. The last word is H-I-L-L. Hill. Mm. Um... Beats me. Uh, <laughs> okay, first word is Jack. Oh, now I see. Jack and Jill went uh -huh. up the hill. Okay, I right. saw it now. Okay. Yeah, so, you're right. So this, yeah, this few slide is really to illustrate how amazing our human mind is. Uh, so the positive sides of things is we can really figure things out without all the details. Technically speaking, by our previous training by a previous world view or existing worldview, we tend to connect the dots on our own. 
the positive, uh, the negative side to things are we bring those knowledge structure in and we start to impose them on. Uh, we presuppose certain things. And uh, because each one of us bring different uh, ex past experiences, knowledge structures, and worldviews, uh, we might look at the same thing and interpret it differently. What we just saw through those last few slides are everybody will interpret it more or less the same. For those who didn't, is precisely they are interpreting it with pre-existing assumptions that could not unlock the freedom to read otherwise. So in designing learning for a big group of people, as opposed to information, when it comes to learning, one size does not fit all. But because of um, administrative purposes, because of financial budget uh, constraints, because of resource constraints, uh, historically till now, most training sessions are designed to be one size fits all. Hence, there are a lot of people who fil filter off right, the bell curve. On the one hand, the super smart Alec folks will like drift away. They don't need the class. They already know what's going on. But on the other side of the bell curve are a lot of people who struggle, struggle like crazy because they're not part of that one size. Hence, we, we need to, in today's world with the digital power, think of uh, solutioning uh, for a company without insisting on a one-size-fits-all. Of course, content like do's and don'ts, policies and all those things, uh, we, we, we have to do top-down. So what I'm also saying from here is that we need to set the bracket when it comes to um, what must be learned. Uh, so the left bracket and the right bracket, that must be uh, relayed, delivered, consumed. But how it is going to be done in between, we need variety. We spoke previously about the um, uh, theory of, um, uh, what do you call that? I think, uh, users having different sensory being debunked, separating those who use their ears more than those who use their eyes versus uh, touch. That is a theory that's debunked. But the one that... Um, we were looking at uh, was allowing people, those who need to reflect, which means they need time to consume what they've learned, apply, reconsider, versus somebody who needs to articulate out. And when they speak out loud, it goes back into their ears. They are much better at that versus somebody who, who needs to, um, uh, say, read the thing on their own. So, this differences is that the way we process information, which is the way we code, encode, decode information, we are different in that sense. But the senses we are using is all of us use all the senses. So therefore, again, when we're designing for learning with a bear in mind, it all has to fire through our brain and all the thoughts uh, outside of the spirit man that is, it's all in this neuro uh, cognitive uh, space in our brain okay so a, a single neuron this is a, I think electronic uh, electron magnetic uh, image of a neutron uh, neuron sorry um, this is the the, 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 the tree like it's called the uh, aspects is called the dendrites and then this is where the neuron is so our brain um, has a lot of them. I don't even know what this is actual, right? 10 to the power of 12. We have that many supposed neurons in our brain. And if you think of the number of dendrites, that many per neurons, then it's about 1,000 trillion power to 15 synaptic connections in the brain. Synaptic connections is when one neuron passes electrical signals and uh, chemical signals to the other one. That's how our cells in our uh, a brain or how our brain processes information and stores. So that's how amazing God has designed our brain to be. Of course, there is the spiritual aspects of things. Okay. So all that to contextualize how many details that we need to consider. 
to develop and to design good learning experiences. So what is learning design? Um, this definition is uh, crafted by me. I believe it is both an art as well as a science. And we must develop it in the business context that is, um, solutions that actually delights the customer. Okay, because if we are designing for an organization, say, say for example, I'm designing for my customer standard charter bank, um, I'm actually designing it for their talent, for their staff, to strengthen the bank's capability to excel and um, be a forerunner in the banking industry. So therefore, it must be seen as a total business solution, not a, how do I design the screen? How do I project my voice? It's not all these individual parts. It's the sum total of all these different parameters put together, which also includes aspects that functional, how user-friendly, how scalable, and all those things. But they are not like, okay, so this is where I will take a slight detour to talk about the competency model. It's actually a very novel, 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 very noble approach to uh, learning to use competency uh, approach, which our government and a lot of uh, countries uh, promote. But there is a um, drawback with that model. So I've helped uh, develop uh, competencies for uh, WSQ and develop content using competency uh, frameworks as well. So what happens is that uh, the intent is to take a content and break it down into competencies, uh, competency statements. <clears throat> so I, I use the analogy of a bicycle. So it's like I take a bicycle and now I dismantle the bicycle to all its component parts. I learn each of the component parts separately. <clears throat> Good, because it's very efficient for the delivery by the person who needs to deliver, very efficient for the organization who needs to, uh, like the BSQ to be able to tick and say, yes, it's done, it's cleared, it's, you know. And then uh, very good also for assessment, I will measure this question against this competency. Okay, done. So it's all extremely wonderful from that perspective. The question becomes, what happens after that? Will the learner be able to reassemble all these parts of the bicycle together again as a single whole? Better yet, will the user be able to reassemble all these component parts into a new model of a bicycle? This is where the competency model sometimes uh, stops short of because it's overly focused on just the component parts, learning each of the component parts. So, again, we need the big picture. So in our organization, some, tonight's focus a lot has to do with employability and skills. Hence, I'm focused a lot of the content on um, businesses. So in any organization, they have their key performance indicators. That's what they measure, whether they have scaled, whether they have expanded, whether they have reached their goals. Then that's uh, sort of cascade down to the department level, which then cascade down to functionally which ones are the mission critical ones uh, to, re, uh, to support this uh, key performance indicators. And that itself will translate to policies and standards. And then it process, uh, translates to processes. So if this is aligned in any organization, meaning all the workflow processes are backwards aligned to the organization's KPI, very good solid ground. Now then, we, we then see the processes translate to workflow into those who have to execute the executing roles. A, B, and C is just the roles. Okay? And how the communication structure uh, is Oh my. Thin to a higher uh, height here is to show the level of uh, IT. Okay. 
very low IT adoption here, very high IT adoption there. So here, very strong face-to-face, -face, the OJT on the job training, self-learning mode, uh, the uh, electronic performance support system, and we e-learning, group learning, virtual learning. Okay? So just going towards more uh, technology-driven side. So in any competencies you have, the functional, technical, you have the supporting, you have the leadership and management. Now, when you build your learning management system, you need to look at uh, all this, right? the learning design, the strategies to support both globalization and localization. And then conversely, where there is a lot of digital uh, intervention, the subject matter experts time is less. Unless it's with the virtual, which is synchronous, and then it goes up a little bit. But if it's face to face on this side, then the subject matter expertise, uh, domain experts' time is a lot more. Okay. So that's where we, before we even talk about what learning modules are and the learning enterprise uh, uh, type of uh, learning management system. Okay, before I continue from here, questions? Um, Very heavy stuff, yeah? Yeah, no, but. Um... I wonder, I mean, you, you said, I think earlier on that uh, learning online, uh, particularly through Zoom and all that, right, can only mm. um, reach a certain level, as you know, like you mentioned about disciple making and all that. Mm. Mm. So my question is, I mean, in a world where you have no choice, right, I mean, for a moment, we were completely locked down, we can't mm. get out of our house. You know, mm. to meet people and all that. Mm. And some would say, right, that in the future, um, in the end times, that may be the norm. So how, I mean, how do we overcome, right, that we are forced to use um, things like Zoom and we can't meet in person? So at the end of the day, it's not the technology. Technology is only the enabler. It's the approach which comes back to the human being. So if we use Zoom, the approach being trans transmissional or transactional, that means what I'm doing right now, I'm just one person, I'm just talking away. I'm just talking away. Z using Zoom just to do that, what we're saying is, remember the impact is not there. Sitting down and watch a movie, the impact is not there. There has to be subsequent other things. Your breakout room is one thing. Uh, your one-on-one -on -one phone call. Uh, instead of a, a, a group Zoom session, maybe in a week I will follow up with two um, video calls, either, either with uh, um, WhatsApp or any other tool or still with Zoom. That intimate exchange where people feel safe enough to share openly what's battling within them. So my, my statement is not that if we use Zoom, it cannot be. It's rather that how we use Zoom. It was purely thinking that by having a Zoom session and I'm transmitting, I'm just transmitting, somehow that's going to cause a change in a person's behavior. That's why I'm saying it won't happen. There has to be a lot of follow-up, uh, high touch. Unfortunately, not physical touch, but high touch in terms of video to video. Why, why do you say, unfortunately, that the high uh, touch uh, is, is virtual? I think um, physical high touch is very important. At the end of the day, of course, Jesus didn't have that challenge back in his days. But if you notice how back in the biblical times, a large part of the impact is high touch in so far as how Jesus was there for the woman at the well. Jesus was there for the lady who was uh, accused of adultery. He was there for uh, the blind man. Um, we don't know whether he physically touched them, but I would say there would perhaps have been a pat on the back, a touch on the arm, maybe, maybe not. But the full presence of a human being can never be substituted. But yes, we are in strange times. I like to believe it is not necessary 
permanent forever before the Christ comes back. I believe it will break. Uh, so now's the time where we become creative to know how to get around it. Like for example, now that we are in this phase, we can still meet with people. We can still have that session. Uh, we can still have people come to our house, limited, no less. Um, so I can create a safe environment to invite, in, invite that one person after the session to come to my place for coffee and build that consistent, uh, I care how you think, I care how you feel, I care uh, enough to want to spend time with you to let you share your pains with me. You can never do that online without demonstrating uh, you're willing to sacrifice uh, you know, precious time beyond a digital platform. Okay, some food for thought, thanks. Okay, the next slide or two is just uh, not necessary for you to pay too much attention to the specific words. Um, this is just somebody who, uh, this guy, uh, I like his uh, work. Uh, he's done a lot of wonderful um, writing. And one of the books he wrote is uh, Design of Everyday Things. You can get from the library. It's really very wonderful. If I skip over all this, this is simply what he says. Good design is clear thinking made visible. Bad design is stupidity made visible. So that's the best, simplest way to uh, define common sense. So in why the word design? Because in good learning, there should be a design, right? So we must be very clear in our mind what uh, is the impact we want. How do we want to engineer the impact? How do we then measure whether the impact has been uh, accomplished? Everything else, if it's not done, it falls under bad design. And that really makes the feeling of it's very haphazard, it's very... Um, neither here nor there kind of feeling. And somewhere along the way, you lose the learner. Okay. So this is a very good example. I, I, I found this, and to be honest, I forgot to write down the name of the place where I found this information. But uh, you want to take a quick, a quick read. There's no need to read it aloud. And then I'll comment on this. Okay, now I'm surprised that this is even needed to be written out in such a way. To me, this is common sense. I, I can't teach you how to dive by sitting you in a classroom. I can't describe the steps to you and the, how you manage your breathing, all those things by pure text description. Or for that matter, showing you video or somebody who's gone through it. The best way to learn something like this is to, to be in the actual real world, with real water. Okay, maybe you start in the swimming pool to learn the techniques first. But you need to go to the sea to have the sense of the current, the danger, to really respect that there's danger when the current is flowing over you or there might be uh, you know, creatures like the recent cases of the box jelly, jelly, jellyfish, you know. Until and until we are in the exact behavior where we replicate the behavior in the actual context with the realistic properties of this uh, environment or simulation. Now, we, I'll talk about AR, VR now. Uh, AR is actually not the context, VR. There's so much rave right now about VR. And VR is not that cheap to create, technically speaking. Um, yes, people are enjoying VR. And I will contextualize again. VR is excellent for entertainment, excellent for um, gaming, excellent for uh, recreational. Do I really need an extensive VR to learn how to uh, manage a customer? Do I need VR to, um, uh, to do this relational skill stuff? Debatable. But do I need VR to do, say, for example, medical, surgical procedures to understand the implication if I cut too hard, I will kill the individual? Or if I don't uh, use the scalpel properly, what kind of messes do I create? Yes, I can see that. So VR is 
modern day name for simulation that we all have been familiar with. I think even your days in uh, military, there were military simulations. Airlines have your flight simulators. Uh, so VR is the modern day version of that. It's a bit more mobile compared to you have to walk into a simulator for flight training or, or any type of uh, that type of simulation. So we have to be again looking at do I need it? What, what do I need it for? What impact am I accomplishing? But the context of this is just to illustrate this thing about common sense. Good design, clear thinking. If I have good design and clear thinking, I don't need anyone to teach me. This is my natural way. My common sense tell me this is the best way to deliver training. But I'm surprised that sometimes people don't have this common sense. Okay? And that's the author of that. So this next few slides, I'll gloss over really quickly, but, but these are just terminologies used a lot in learning design reduction. How do I make things simpler, um, sticky? What are some of the things I can do to make the content stick? Now, if the content requires so much gimmick to stick, then two things I have to ask myself. Is it even a needed content? Uh, or is the learner the right learner in the classroom? If there is a mismatch between the two, that means the learner needs to be in the classroom, the content's lousy. Or the content is okay, but the learner is not the right learner in the classroom. Then, depending on stickiness to make them stick, is the wrong solution. Okay. Now I uh, pause again. Any questions? Uh, no. Okay. So this is something we saw again in the uh, last few sessions. I will build and layer on top of this. So there's a bit of thinking around this one. I'm introducing a concept called the five moments of need to build over this because there is the word we said uh, teachable moments and the, the one that I wanted to focus a lot on is always disturb the equilibrium. Okay. So this five moments of need uh, is uh, when somebody is joining the workforce for the first time, learning something for the first time, or I'm now hungry to want to learn more, still very much a newbie. Later on, <clears throat> as I move up, the ladder or stay long enough with the organization. I'm now trying to apply and recall what I've learned and subsequently I use all that knowledge I've built up to solve problem or crisis. This is for the fifth one will come at detail in. So when I'm designing learning for the left side of the quadrant, the two quadrants on the left side for first time learners on fairly new learners, it's very structured, formalized approach to learning. It can be direct or it could also be indirect. What people use this term called supplantive approach, which is what we said with the um, organization that used the, uh, the Zoom the boom, uh, to, to, to share the video, very supplantive approach. Supplant means I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. So the focus in this case for the learner is very much in acquisition focus. Okay, the mind of the learner is about acquisition. The person delivering is and <clears throat> and throwing content at you. So that's what's called supplanted. Right on this side, once I'm I'm a bit more um, knowledgeable, a bit more seasoned, I can move more towards informal and moment of need performance support, which is where osmosis learn drives the most of our. Uh, influence. Now, this is what people will call generative approach, where you have uh, user-generated content, peer-to-peer -peer, um, review, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges of content. The main focus here is on application and adaptation of the content that the, the, the learner acquired over time. So, depending on which of this quadrant we are interceding, the approach can change. Sometimes there will be bleeding on either side. That means there may be opportunities to apply this type of uh, uh, less structured uh, approach in the left quadrant. Sometimes there may be a need to use a more formalized approach on the right quadrant. But by and large, this is the um, main uh, approach that we see much more um, acceptable uh, to adult learners. So on the left side, we are looking at simpler, simple decision making, quick to address issues, very transactional, transmissional, as I said earlier. 
But once you move towards this side, we're look, looking at more complex decision, more time consuming and more immersive. So back to the whole discipling. If discipling sticks on this side only, it comes as fast back to the parable of the sower, it dissipates as fast. But the more we move to this side where there is that struggling, that battling, that really considering, reflecting, and that struggling from within, and it's very, very immersive, at the same time, it's time consuming, meaning over a period of time, then we see the stronger impact of uh, discipling. So the fifth item is the four, five moments, right? The fifth moment is when there's a need for change like COVID. You've got a question? Yes. Um, you know, a lot of our educational uh, education system in Singapore, mm. in particular, right up to university, I would say, right, mm. is very supplantive mm -hmm. approach. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, th that's a problem, isn't it? It is. That's why um, I, I'm careful in what I'm about to say because I know it may get uh, misinterpreted out of context and draw some negative uh, conclusions. But I, I look back in the days when, uh, say, our, our age group, when we were going to school, we had a lot of time outside of school. We got to go play all kinds of funny games in the in the public compound with kampong friends and all that stuff, right? A lot of learning happens there, which the classroom never taught us. So we had a chance to develop lateral thinking, creative thinking, um, survival, if you will, for, especially for the ones who are very um, stretched financially uh, with a lot of family issues. They tend to develop a lot of survival skills. But if you look at the more last 20 or so years, economy is good, affluence is high, families are more stable in terms of finance, uh, parents are super doting, loving, a lot of them tend to be friends rather than um, taking on the role of authority. So hence the whole conversation around snowflakes and strawberry generation. So they came out to the workforce I remember my first job, uh, I cried a lot because my supervisors, they were all mean. But now I look back and I said, actually, I, I became so much better today because of that very um, negative experience. So the Chinese is a phrase, right? Xian, xian ku hou tian. First, sor uh, bitter, later sweet. So I would say, if we remove this disturb the equilibrium type of uh, experiences from the newcomer to the workforce, we're actually doing them a, a major injustice because they can never stretch beyond the comfort zone. So for example, just quick one. Uh, one of the things like um, many of them would say, you tell me what I'm supposed to do. Tell me the set one, two, three, four, five, and I'll do it. So they're very good at transactional um, uh, tasks. But if you ask them, go and think, go and consider, go and uh, study, come back and make a recommendation. A handful might be able to, many come back and they will struggle. I say, Sorry, I can't, you have to tell me. So, so that separates the group that can stretch beyond the comfort zone versus the group that cannot. So you were saying? Then COVID is good because COVID falls a lot of, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, disequilibrium. Yes. Um, to schooling, right? All levels of schooling has been mm. disrupted. I mean, mm. you know, they have to go to, you know, do it from home and then mm -hmm. change, you know, mm. um, and all that. So I think that's a good thing. That's provided. So that's a teachable moment uh, is another uh, concept altogether. If we, Catch, catch that so-called the Chinese phrase again, right? In the middle of a crisis, there's opportunity. We catch the opportunity to um, leverage it to teach about, to, that means impart the knowledge to the younger people in our life, be it parents or children or 
mentors to the younger generation it, and really take that moment to, to impart, that's great. But if that passing moment is lost, then it may not cause that generative uh, change. So it still depends on human beings to facilitate the change in thinking. Right. Okay, thanks. So I'll try and finish up soon. Um, okay, so this next few, I'm just going to gloss very, very fast because this is all very um, detailed level. So we, we said earlier to separate between surface learning, shallow learning and deep learning. We need to look at how to create intrinsic motivation. Actually, I this is taken from my author. I challenge the word create. Intrinsic motivation is, to me, that starter fire in a gas stove. Without the starter fire, you cannot lit the gas, so to speak. So, we um, manipulate, we can uh, create, we can do all kinds of things with the extrinsic motivation in order to connect with the intrinsic motivation. So if the person has no intrinsic motivation that which is within them, the external, the extrinsic motivation can never, there's no subtle fire to even light the fire. So this one, it's a, 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 a very funny uh, statement made by someone when I was uh, doing training in India. So I was using the proverbial, if a horse or a cow doesn't want to drink, you cannot force it to drink. So one of the participants made a very interesting uh, statement. He goes, oh, but we can make the water trough very colorful, decorated with all kinds of uh, bells or uh, colors and stuff. That's a good uh, illustration of the point I'm trying to say. If the cow or the horse doesn't want to drink, which is no intrinsic motivation, you, however you decorate the water trough, it can never make, the, it can never make them drink. So. First, you must let the intrinsic motivation fire up. Again, if the person doesn't belong to the group, that means I am attending the course because my boss told me to come. I'm attending the course because I lost my job. I've got no choice. Government paying me money, so I come and sit. No? So these are all going to bring uh, a scenario where they have no intrinsic motivation on the nature of the content. It, of course, learner activity, we must do a lot to rehearse that learning from many different angles, the social learning. And then, of course, the scaffolding, the knowledge base, we must allow the user uh, to develop, uh, you know, the self-directed uh, access to knowledge. Other very uh, uh, various strategies, uh, in part, I covered it last week, so I'm just going to gloss over uh, asking questions, pro probing questions, using problem-centric approach, uh, giving, you know, a uh, Republic Poly approach, right? I give you a problem to solve and you go and uh, do what you need to do. We teach you some content when you can use the uh, content to apply to solving that problem. Case study. Um, now, this is some things that is in times past hardly ever done. But in more recent days, a lot more teachers and schools and classes are doing. Meaning, I give you an activity to do in the process of doing the activity, you will come back and tell me what issues you struggled with, what resources that you like, what knowledge that you like. And from there, we will generate a whole common ground for starting the session. Okay? So these are fun ways to really uh, engage the people to learn. So this can be done before we go into the content body. It can also be done during the content body or it can be done post the content body. So it depends on how the person wants to design this. Okay. Um, Bloom's taxonomy, right? Uh, getting them involved more into the top upper section of the taxonomy and not just focus on, uh, this is just an uh, American uh, uh, thing about, you know, just repetitive, I'll uh, just repeat to you what you told me kind of thing. Very low order questions. Um, I'll jump to here. Now this, this is just, uh, again, my way of saying, um, now you and I are connected by a video. So I can, if I want to look at you, and I'm actually holding a, a separate uh, device so I can actually look at your face below. Uh, that's not a look down here. Now I can actually study your face uh, and make some kind of judgment whether you're following me or you're not following me. 
but it's very difficult compared to if we were in a classroom physically. But in an e-learning environment, meaning literally I cannot see you, you cannot see me. So on this side is the learning designer, on this side is the learner. The interface in between the two is the computer. This is, I'm talking about e-learning. Huh? So here this person is trying to design, let's say um, A is trying to design for B. A, or rather, A is trying to design for A, B, uh, sorry, B, C, D, and E. A have no idea of who B, C, D, and E is. Zero idea. The only idea they, A has is, oh, there are staff who are um, attending our onboarding session, or there are staff who is uh, doing a MAS required um, mandatory uh, clear, uh, anti money laundering. That's, that's about as much as this person knows. So, what are the tools in this person's hands? Okay. This person must have clear, some of this you've seen, I said earlier, clear intent aligned to the organization's mission, have agility with the um, tools and platform, must be conversant with all those things. So these are all skills. Okay, have process mindset. So all these things are within the control of the designer. Okay. Now, on the other hand, what does a learner want? A learner wants to be challenged, wants to be engaged and enriched. The learner wants to have a construct that impacts the long-term memory leading to transformation. Now, this is obviously an assumption here. There are those who don't care. It's just what, why you waste my time to sit in the classroom. I just pass my test and I'll walk out. But yeah, at the same time, uh, last week I shared the, um, or maybe uh, a different one. There's a number of polls out there where um, it just asks, what is the most important uh, ask of staff, what's the most important thing that keeps you with the organization? High on the list is opportunity to have uh, development, which means whenever the staff feels that there is a, a, a way to extend their knowledge, to develop their talent, they will tend to stay longer. So if I take that as the basis of the assumption, then yes. They want to have that new construct that helps them impact their uh, uh, behavior leading to transformation. They want to improve their performance with a permanent change in behavior. So these are some of the assumptions that what the uh, learner desires, right? Doing satisfied with uh, personal development and growth. Now, what then connects between the two? Because like I say, this, the learner cannot see who's the designer. The designer cannot see who's the learner. So what is the connecting event? Actually, it's just mouse and keyboard. Now, I'm not talking mobile. Huh? I'm now talking uh, laptop. Only the mouse and the keyboard. In the classroom, it's the facilitator and the uh, uh, instructor. Now, sometimes the facilitator and the instructor is not the designer. Okay? So this, this one would be, if it's the same person, then this, this is not a big deal. Okay? Learning props and resources uh, for classroom. Learning activities and reflection, digital or classroom. Learning media, digital devices, um, which can be blended or class, uh, digital. So these are the events or the interfaces that connects the two. So for the person who's designing, they need to understand no matter how fanciful you want your learning experience to be with a laptop, it's only the mouse and the keyboard for e-learning okay. and without the media using digital it's also going to be super boring so you need to use media so these are the um, interfaces wherein the intent of this design is being brought into the paradigm of the learner okay. very heavy stuff but again it's just topical surface level I'm talking about. Yeah, I think I'm getting yeah to the last part already. Just wanted to last week we look at um, Jesus going through all this, right? So I'm I'm not gonna spend time here. I want to show you this one. I am adding one more. Very interesting. This is the two two friends walking on the road to Omeas. And uh, Jesus asked these questions. What are you dis discussing so intently as you walked along? As if Jesus didn't know, right? What things? As if he didn't know. 
wasn't it predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering, entering his glory? As if Jesus didn't know. So why? Actually, he was trying to connect with them in this learning experience, if you will. So, Jesus approached them with probing questions. Then from there, he then linked it back to the writings of Moses, the prophets, and so on. So again, this very simple experience, uh, example of Jesus, we can also take it in any of our uh, delivery. It's, we can pretend that we don't know something, and we ask as if we want to be a keen learner asking for the answer, allowing the, for the other party to articulate it. So these are, instead of, this is generative as opposed to supplantive. Let me tell you, let me tell you, you know. So I don't tell you, I pretend I don't know, I let you tell me. Okay? So in the end, um, when they had aha moment, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us? So creating that aha moment. Okay, I think I'll skip from here. All the rest I can stop. Uh, questions? Um, yes, um, you know, this, um, I mean, uh, just a comment, not so much a question, right? Uh, mm. The, you know, when you go online, like you were saying that it is difficult, right, to see your students' facial expression, see whether they're engaged or disengaged and all that. Mm. Um, but technology has been developed, right? Uh, facial recognition, right? Mm. Where, you know, uh, the technology would, would tell the teacher, uh, there's a mm. indicator, you know, mm. how many uh, of yes. your students are paying attention, you know, just yes. by their face, mm. their eyeball mm. and everything. Mm -hmm. I mm. think in China, the, especially, uh, they're developing some of, a lot of this technology because... Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the exams has to be done online, you know, to prevent mm. cheating, mm. Um, to even uh, pick up the surrounding, you know, whether there's mm. anyone prompting and everything. Mm. Uh, so what, what's your view? I mean, uh, will, will that help? I mean, uh, if, if you have technology that aids you uh, and tell you your students are engaged, disengaged. Okay, let me use another app as an example to come back into answering this question um, at one time uh, they call this an employee engagement uh, app uh, that was I mean it's still around it was developed about um, eight, eight or so years back it became started to come into the industry it became clear at some point it was a way of tracking when a user, uh, 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 employee comes to work, when an employee leaves, when an employee does this. So it clearly, employees have to realize it's a governing and policing tool. Recently, uh, due to a client requirement, I have to install DingTalk, uh, part of Lazada's uh, uh, slew of uh, tools. And I went online, I read a little bit. Um, within the China context, they kind of like accepted as a culture. But those who were not from China, they had a whole lot of negative things to say. It's a way also of checking the same thing. Uh, and so depending on the, again, right, the tool itself is neutral. It's the user. So apparently in some cases, um, the supervisor used it as a way of uh, uh, catching a person for coming in late, uh, for um, draconic uh, type of uh, management. So it led to a lot of mistrust. So I, when you were describing it, yes, there's a lot of, even in Singapore, such tools already uh, being uh, marketed to organizations. Again, it's not a tool, it's the person who is going to use it, it's the policies of the organization who is going to implement it. If I'm with you like that, right? Yes, uh, even in e-learning, I cannot, okay, so this is the classic, right? 
Let's go back to the context. In e-learning, I cannot see you. I've developed the e-learning and I ask you to sit through the e-learning. It's possible that you go behind the scene. It's actually, by the way, happening. It's told to my very ears. Uh, all those uh, mandatory courses that MAS have required of financial institutions, most of them are so busy doing their business as usual thing, right? Hey, can you share with me what you went through now? Because typically, more or less, you can guess the answer. So 80% of the questions will be the same. Or, hey, um, I don't know. I just, I just do the test without going to the content. Any range of this. Not because somebody wants to cheat, but because they're so busy. A large group, maybe a handful, maybe really uh, outright wants to cheat. So as far as the regulators are concerned, at this moment, they don't care. They just want that to show. So as far as the bank is concerned, here's my tick list. The bank is concerned. Okay, the bank has done it. Mm. Now, later on, when there are violations, regulatory bodies will come out, you're fine, $1 million. So they figure the organizations don't want to lose $1 million. They will do what it takes. So in that same way, it's not that e-learning that changed the behavior. That behavior should change when it's on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. And who knows it best? The immediate supervisor, the peers around them. <coughs> so the ecosystem needs to be in place. But very often, that's not in place. So you still have the rogue trader, the rogue person here and there. So coming back to this thing about facial recognition. If the students, if the recipient of that uh, um, technology realizes that I'm being monitored for governance and policing, the mistrust immediately should so high, you, the management will be happy to have all that stuff, but you get this whole other set of cultural issues. You don't trust me? I don't trust you. And how would the organization go forward from there? So there are a lot of implications from that perspective. Okay, thanks.